today our title is Head for the Lifeboat. And I want to tell you where I got the inspiration for this devotion. You've probably seen the movie Titanic, or perhaps you saw the old musical from the 1970s called The Unsinkable Molly Brown. And both these movies feature a real life person, Molly Brown, who grew up extremely poor, didn't know how to read or write until much later in her life, her husband happened to strike it rich, and Molly convinced him that they needed to move to Denver, Colorado, the big city at the time, and she tried her best to make her way into the higher echelons of Denver society. Molly was on the Titanic because she was returning back to the United States after an extended trip to Europe. When the Titanic began to sink, the crew members were ordered to take care of the first class passengers first. And within the first class passengers, make sure that the women and children were on the boat. The story goes that Molly was safely in her lifeboat when she glanced around and saw that there were quite a few empty seats still on that lifeboat. Supposedly, she called up in protest and said, you must fill this boat before you set sail. At the very least, Molly is documented as keeping up the morale on her lifeboat and comforting those who watch the ship go down. And as they watch that ship go down, they realize that they lost all their loved ones who didn't make it onto a lifeboat. Now that you know where I got my inspiration, I want to read it today. If the world's ship is sunk and we as believers are in the lifeboat, are we helping to rescue those who are drowning around us? Are we encouraging and aiding them to scramble up onto the boat? I wonder. Many believers are attending a huge party thanking their divine captain for saving them, but they're making so much noise that they can't hear the cries of those begging for a hand up into the lifeboat. Others are leaning over the edge of the boat, busily bashing anyone in reach with their blanket judgments, pet doctrines, end time theology, and carefully memorized Bible tracts. When their rescue techniques prove unsuccessful, those would-be heroes shake their heads in sorrow, be moaning the hard-hearted, unreceptive hearts of those who choose to drown around them. It seems that many Christians are quick to condemn the world and write off its inhabitants as lost causes. It's odd, though. Jesus never did. He healed, lovingly confronted, and walked among the lost, showing them the way to safety. Consistently, he engaged those who opposed him by carefully choosing his words and actions, always in consideration of the audience he was trying to reach. His intention was to breathe truth and life into the hearts of those he touched. Of course, we know not everybody was receptive to Jesus' words or actions. If I were writing this devotion today, I would add another group of people on this boat, or maybe two groups of people on these boats. And these are the groups that squabble amongst themselves. They might be on opposite ends of the political spectrum, but they both call themselves Christians. Or perhaps they are cessationists, perhaps they're charismatic. They're on opposite ends of the spectrum. In my mind's eye, I could see these two factions trying to sit as far away from each other as possible, pressing against their edge of the boat. Now, if that particular lifeboat happened to have more people who swayed on one side more than the other, that ship would become unbalanced and would be in danger of tipping over. The scenario I just described isn't a new one. Paul was addressing this very issue in 1 Corinthians 3, and I'm going to be reading from the message translation. Paul received word that there were quite a few people who were concerned for him because Apollos was gathering a lot of people under his teaching. You can tell Paul wasn't overly concerned about this, however, by what he writes in 1 Corinthians starting at verse 5. 
when one of you says, I'm on Paul's side, and another says, I'm for Apollos, aren't you being totally infantile? Who do you think Paul is anyhow? Or Apollos, for that matter, servants, both of us. Servants who have waited on you as you gradually learn to entrust your lives to our mutual master. We each carried out our servant assignments. I planted the seed, Apollos watered the seed, but God made you grow. It's not the one who plants or the one who waters who is at the center of this process, but God who makes all things grow. Planting and watering are menial servant jobs at minimum wages. What makes them worth doing is the God we are serving. You happen to be God's field in which we are working. I don't think I need to add a practical application to this teaching beyond maybe you want to go back and read the chapter in the book if you have it, or you can just rewind this video, but just ask the Lord to search your heart and to show you any areas in your Christian culture lifestyle that are creating a stumbling block between you and those who God would want you to reach out and touch.